Remembering back, my first flirtation with science was geology. As early as 1980, I was keenly aware that rocks were important. As my mother was a rock hound, and we'd travel the western US ostensibly for vacation. But really to rock hunt, and also accompany my father, who was a military contractor following where work led. I very keenly became aware of geology on May 18th, 1980, living near Portland, Oregon, and watching Mount St. Helens erupt from a distance. A memory as vivid in my head today as it ever has been. But that early experience with science led to one Christmas when I was somewhere around 11 years old, when my parents bought me an inexpensive microscope and telescope set, one of each, which were my constant companions for years after. Indeed, I still have them. That tiny telescope, however, with only a 30mm objective lens, allowed me to spot something that ultimately resulted in this channel, the rings of Saturn, which were visible even in such a tiny telescope, though much sharper than Galileo saw them in 1610, as fuzzy lobes in his primitive refractor of only a few millimeters larger than mine. But visual astronomy is visual astronomy, the visible light spectrum. Our ability to perceive and see this area of the spectrum is probably not something we would widely share with alien life. Indeed, we don't entirely share it with the animal kingdom here on Earth. For example, we tend to see color more vividly than some other mammals. Perhaps some adaptation for hunting and gathering, perhaps to spot colorful berries. And certain insects see into the ultraviolet spectrum where we cannot. Again, probably something to do with the circumstances of their existence. Extending this to alien life casts an even wider net in that it's difficult to envision what senses they might have. Eyes are useful, but not universal to life on Earth. Hearing is also useful, but not so much on a world like Mars where sound has a much shorter range, or that might result in super hearing, or on an ocean world where sound would have a much longer range. But to detect rather than perceive is a completely different matter. We don't really perceive ultraviolet light until we get a sunburn because we don't see it directly. But we know it exists, and we can measure it. But humans from not that long ago had no idea it was even there. Radio even more so. But with modern technology, we can basically detect the entire electromagnetic spectrum. So technological aliens with science are going to know about the spectrum as well, and measure it with instruments not unlike our own. It's an interesting thought that while aliens themselves may be radically different from us biologically, we would probably recognize their radio telescopes, and they would recognize ours, because nature offers only a few ways to build a radio telescope. Nature dictates the ability to detect it, and you must play by nature's rules. Now intelligent aliens without technology and science would be essentially impossible to detect, but those with advanced technology may stick out like a sore thumb. We often look to radio for SETI. It's ostensibly a straightforward technosignature to detect, but there are others, and of great interest are certain types of technosignatures that may reveal what an alien civilization is doing as far as scientific exploration. One of these potentially detectable scientific megastructures are gigantic telescopes. First we have something that isn't often mentioned, but it's true. Other than its biosphere, among the most detectable things this planet has ever emitted that aliens might catch involves our scientific instruments. Our broadcast radio or television is often held up as something aliens might detect, but those signals are very, very weak, and it's not likely past about a light year that anyone would see it. Unless they have a radio telescope the size of the city of New York, more on that in a bit. But only if they are relatively close. Both because we've only been producing detectable radar since the mid-20th century, our signals have not had time to reach out very far even at the speed of light, but also because of signal strength. So those sorts of science-based technologies aren't as detectable as you might think. And one thing that would most certainly not be detectable is the infamous 1936 Olympics, most famously brought up in the book and film Contact. You'd have not detected that broadcast in Berlin without the right equipment, much less in orbit and certainly not at cosmic distances. A question I often get is how about the nuclear testing? Would the detonation of a nuclear bomb be detectable at a distance? The answer is not really. Certainly within Earth orbit, very likely the Moon, and perhaps for a large part of the solar system, but at interstellar distances, not likely. Oddly though, say there is a von Neumann probe sitting in the solar system monitoring us, a double flash from a thermonuclear detonation would be distinct, 
and if you saw a series of them, you could deduce that a nuclear war was occurring on Earth. A sad techno signature indeed. But I often wonder about a scenario somewhere out there in the universe similar to the Vulcans detecting humans through the first warp drive signature depicted in Star Trek, just as they happen to be passing through. Might a nuclear test detonation get someone's attention who happens to be watching our world from within our solar system? What might they do? Might they make contact or maintain a closer but subtle presence waiting to stop anything that might get out of hand? in the interest of altruism or preserving any occurrence of intelligent life in the galaxy. This also works for nuclear propulsion. By dropping hydrogen bombs out the back of your properly armored and blast-plated spacecraft, you would have one of the few ways we currently possess technologically to reach some real fraction of the speed of light, to get to other star systems faster than chemical rockets can do it. That too might be detectable, at least at close range. But ultimately, ambiguity once again rules the day here. But there's one thing that once existed that in no uncertain terms told a large swath of the galaxy that we are here and who and what instrument sent it, though it hasn't had time to propagate too far out into the galaxy. No one in the path of this radio signal can miss it if they are monitoring the skies with all sky SETI surveys all the time. It was the Arecibo Radio Telescope. It's the famous Arecibo message that was broadcast by that radio telescope in 1974. It was actually a half-hearted signal as far as contacting aliens, however in that we never repeated it, and it really was more for show that we could actually do it to commemorate a renovation of the telescope, which decades later collapsed due to errors in the original manufacturing that weren't ever caught. But if anyone ever detected this message, it's possible they might be able to work out some details of the instrument that sent it. The reason is simply that included in the message was a pictorial description of the telescope itself. So if aliens can actually decode the message as a binary string, they will see a representation of a human-built radio telescope. As an aside, there is another way, though a long shot right now, where an alien civilization could detect the specifics of our technology. It's another concept covered by Star Trek, this time in the first movie. They could run across a piece of our space trash, such as a defunct Voyager or Pioneer spacecraft drifting across interstellar space. That's so far beyond a needle in a haystack that it almost certainly will never happen, but if it did, it would represent aliens coming across a human scientific instrument, and in the case of those spacecraft, bearing messages from Earth. So the point is, our science is among the most visible things we do as far as aliens are concerned. So assuming that aliens are the same way, what could we look for as far as technosignatures that involve alien science experiments? Well, the first would be megastructure telescopes. Here we deal with two basic types of telescope that are analogous in many ways to more familiar megastructure concepts in speculative SETI. This gets into the difference between Dyson Spheres and Dyson Swarms. Freeman Dyson's original idea was the Swarm, which would be an orbiting cloud or constellation of energy collectors designed to collect as much energy as possible from a star. A Dyson Sphere, which really should be called a Stapledon Sphere as it predates Dyson, is a completely solid encasement of a star to collect 100% of its energy. And there are variants, such as a Niven ring, where it's simply a solid ring around a star, potentially not only collecting some fraction of the star's energy, but also providing a living surface much greater than any one planet can provide. As an aside, for those interested in Larry Niven's concepts, see a link below to an Event Horizon interview where I discussed some of them with Larry, along with his fellow science fiction master Gregory Benford. But here's the kicker. Any of these platforms can be used to host telescopes pointing away from the host star, meaning such structures are dual use. This is sometimes termed as a hypertelescope, power your society with one side and study the universe with the other, at least within limits. This may not be the best method, for example, for infrared astronomy. We're already flirting with a related idea, radio telescopes on the far side of the moon. The idea there is that you can put a radio telescope on the far side of the moon and do clean SETI searches because the bulk of the moon is blocking almost all Earth interference. Being on the outside of a Dyson structure should do the same, but provide a surface area much larger than a planet in which to create an array of radio telescopes operating as an interferometer. This would yield a resolution far higher than anything you could do on the surface of a planet. And in the case of a Dyson Swarm, it's already something we've begun, 
in the form of all of our defunct past spacecraft in solar orbit. You could even apply this concept to the James Webb Space Telescope. While it peers out into the cosmos opposite and insulated from the sun, its sunlit side collects solar energy for electrical power. This scales up, however. If you're working with interferometers, the laws of physics allow you to build telescopes the size of a planet, or the size of a star system, since it's made up of multiple units and not one single massive dish or lens, or even the size of multiple star systems. Yes, interstellar-sized telescopes are in principle possible, if you're willing to allow for the time needed to transfer all of the data being collected. But for a civilization that lasts for billions of years, even an interferometer the size of their home galaxy is allowed by physics. Difficult, yes, but in this case difficulty is merely a function of time. Interferometers can be optical or radio, etc., or even multi-use. If you can station an optical telescope array in another star system, you can station an infrared array or radio array as well. This would offer an immense opportunity. You could study the universe at resolutions so precise that you could spot continents on exoplanets, or even exoplanets in other galaxies. In radio, you could hear signals from just about anywhere in the galaxy, even if they are extremely weak. There are tons of reasons to build giant telescopes of this nature, thus it seems reasonable to try to detect them as technosignatures. This would likely be done through the transit method, as the objects, if they are large enough, pass in front of their host star. Certain arrangements of these types of telescopes probably would not be visible. But if the components are large enough, you might see them. You might also detect in radio or laser the communications between the member units of the array. But those aren't the only types of megatelescopes that might be detectable. Another option would be to look for megatelescopes at certain points around a star. The gravity of stars bend light and thus can be used as gravitational lenses themselves if you put a receiver at certain exact points in a star system. Get a big enough megastructure receiver transiting, and you might be able to not only spot it, but due to its precise location, you might be able to reasonably eliminate any potential natural origins for the object you've spotted. And if you have a number of them in the same orbit, all using the same star as a gravitational lens to look in different directions, it would be even more visible and unnatural looking. An even stranger option would be if you turned an entire planet or exomoon into a telescope array using liquid mercury telescopes. You can't use this technique in space, you need a gravitational body, but you can make a comparatively inexpensive telescope array this way. Cover an entire moon or planet with these, and that in principle should be detectable as a technosignature. Though we'd need much more advanced instrumentation than we currently have, probably on the level of a megatelescope. But telescopes don't have to have huge components. You could hypothetically create a nanotechnological cloud telescope, the size of a star system as well. That would be difficult to detect, however, as it probably would be indistinguishable from a dust cloud. But there is one other type of mega instrument we might detect, and it's very different from a telescope. It's gigantic particle accelerators that advanced aliens might construct to get near the highest energies possible in the universe to expand their knowledge of physics. These would be the size of star systems and produced characteristic high energy neutrinos. Other than the Big Bang, it's unlikely anything in nature could produce energies this high, known as the Planck energy. So if we ever saw these types of neutrinos, we'd have to ask if there is some high energy process in nature that we're unaware of, or if we're seeing the activities of alien physicists. And if we did see that, it would teach us a science lesson by way of an alien civilization that we still have a lot of work to do in achieving a complete understanding of physics. Thanks for listening. I'm futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently worried about the neighbors. So we build a giant mega telescope and point it at a nearby star system, only to see the aliens construct another giant mega telescope pointing back at us. And that's first contact. Very awkward. And be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular, in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.